Good afternoon. So this is a little talk about some of the things that the five of us and our colleagues and a lot of other people did using and abusing MySQL uh, as part of this last presidential campaign. So my colleague Lee and I, we were not in order, um, the ones without the Google uniforms, are from a company called Blue State Digital. Lee is our senior systems administrator. I'm the senior software architect. Uh, these are some of Blue State's clients. The one in the upper left is the one that we're talking about today. You may recognize some of the others. This is a very quick summary of what we do. Um, these are the things that we do mainly for campaigns, other political groups, and stuff like that. You can ask us more about that later, because really, what you want to know about. Before we had some of those other clients, life was relatively normal. Then, <laughs> thanks, Jack. Thanks. So, what's the first thing you do when you uh, get a call one day and find out that your company is about to host a, a website for someone who might become one of the leading presidential candidates? Um, well, the first thing you do is capacity planning. And well, what's capacity planning really? It's just looking at where we've been before and trying to use that to uh, figure out where we're going to go. So what were the things that we had to go on? Um, to what thing that Chuck didn't mention was that uh, our company was founded by uh, members of the tech team who helped the uh, 2004 Howard Dean presidential campaign. So we had their anecdotes and their war stories to go from, uh, but little actual hard data uh, from that period. Uh, additionally, we had the 2006 camp, uh, midterm campaign, and um, from there, uh, we got some numbers, but again, because it was a midterm, those numbers were a little bit less. Uh, also, at that point, we only had about 30 clients, or at least 30 election-related clients, and a big day for us then was uh, 150 hits per second on our web server. So what were the things that we looked at? We started looking at things like fundraising, uh, mass emailing, and we also wanted to think about what sort of capacity we needed for our web servers. So the first number we came from was just kind of a projection forward. We looked at... Um, fundraising, we figured we'd probably need the capacity to raise about uh, $250, 290000000 million. How did that one work out? Well, it's been reported that we raised over half a billion dollars online. Really interesting to note is that was also about 4, billion, excuse me, 4 million individual donors made this happen. Other thing we talked about was uh, emails. We figured we'd need to send about 250 emails to 5 to 6 million people. Uh, we kind of missed this one a little bit, too. <laughs> By the end of the campaign, we had 13 million people on the list, and from February of 07 to October, uh, excuse me, November of 08, we sent nearly 2 billion emails. Um, I could spend a whole separate space of time just talking about the headaches that went with that. Lastly, we figured we need capacity to support about 800 hits per second on our web servers, um, which was obviously a whole lot more than we saw during the 2006 midterms. Um, we, how'd we do on this one? <laughs> yeah, uh, October 29th, for those who don't uh, recall, that was the, the so-called infomercial where he bought 30 minutes of time uh, on all the major networks and ended up, uh, you know, at the end, gave a live speech at the end where he called on everyone to go to the BarackObama.com website and help get out the vote. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> you know, what was a real, you know, testament to the folks uh, who, who helped build this site and helped run it and, you know, and, and the systems people and the developers was that we actually were able to keep the site up and running through that storm of 4,300 hits per second. Of course, this is the uh, MySQL conference, so what's the, uh, what's the big question on everyone's mind, right? What happened to the database? <laughs> That was us, deer in the headlights, uh, for a lot of periods of time during the campaign. And um, the big question we had to deal with, I'm going to talk some stories. This is, talk is called Stories from the Campaign. And um, you know, Chuck and Steve and Mike and Ian, they're going to talk about some, some really clever things that happen within databases and within things like that. So I figured, I'm a sysadmin, I'm not a, a DBA, and so I'm going to talk about some more real world type things that may have affected you know, similar stories that folks in this audience might be able to tell and what happens when you're doing it, you know, running for president. So a uh, big problem we had was actually dealing just with the raw amount of data. Um, when we started, remember those numbers I gave you from 2006, 
We had a very generic setup. We only used my ISOM tables. Uh, we used a combination of replicas and logical dumps to do our backups. Um, well, we hadn't really at this time done much server tuning. We hadn't thought about using other storage engines, and we didn't really account for the fact how those changes were going to impact uh, our system. So obviously the first thing that happens is that our data grows beyond our ability to take a backup in any reason reasonable amount of time. Um, so we had to start looking, and in fact, it grew at one point to uh, it, over five terabytes. And for reasons that I'll probably talk about a little bit later, reseeding the, the, the slaves actually took a lot of time, and we had to do it fairly often uh, with our mechanism. So this is just kind of a cautionary tale, and what we went to at that point, we decided to, okay, we're going to get ourselves a block level uh, file system that we can take snapshots. That will solve all our, all our backup problems, all our, our replica reseed problems, right? Wrong. Because <laughs> here's what happens. Overnight, when the database isn't busy actually running all the social networking and email systems, we would do all this data processing, reporting, analytics, and so forth. And these were jobs that would end up running for hours and hours and hours. And obviously, you know, to try and get a lock on the tables to get a snapshot, you know, that would get kind of queued in with all the other stuff. We'd get half situations where half the tables were locked and half weren't. Sort of the whole thing has come coming down. So <laughs> one of the problems that we faced over the course of the campaign was we had a ship date we couldn't push. No one was going to move, right? No one was going to move election day. Can't call up the engineer and say, I don't think we're going to make this delivery date. So we were forced into a situation where we'd be short on resources and short on time. And that forced us to put into production uh, solutions that we couldn't test as thoroughly as we wanted to. And in that case, what we would end up doing is relying on stuff that has been tested over time. And that wasn't a particularly clever or slick solution. Um, so what, what actually the last few weeks of the campaign, the way we were doing our backups was that um, you know, I or one of my sysadmins would actually get up first thing in the morning after the reporting queries had run, stop my SQL, take the snapshot and start it. It was the human element. And I'm sure there's people out there asking, well, why didn't we just script it? Well, the answer is we could, but like I said, we couldn't test these things and none of us were comfortable with putting untested scripts into production and putting them into a cron job and letting them run overnight. And so the truth is, we wouldn't have been sleeping anyways because we'd be so worried about what was happening. Uh, in the database while we were trying to sleep that we got up anyway. So um, this is a story of you know, a lot of innovation that happened during the campaign um, really should be credited to the folks uh, in the field um, and out you know, getting out the vote and stuff. And you know, all the gears underneath were, were, were still uh, a little raw. So um, I'm going to think pass to Chuck here. And he's going to talk about some of the tricks that we came up to in the database here. Thank you guys very much. I'll be back again. You don't have to clap yet. I'll be back. So one of the things that the Obama campaign did that was very effective is they knew their constituents. And if you follow politics, there was a sense that for a long time, the Republican Party had an advantage in terms of having really good data on who their voters were. And basically, in this election, we caught up. Um, so. Lee talked about our email numbers a little bit, about how we had a 13 million person email list at the end of the campaign. Well, the campaign never emailed all of those people the same thing. They would slice them down and say, like, all right, if you've contributed, then we're going to send you one email. If you signed up and never contributed, we're going to send you another. Um, they created groups. They targeted people by what they had done. They took what the field people were doing imported it into the database to tag people as volunteers or whatnot. So that's what list cutting is. List cutting is taking those 13 million constituents and cutting them into different sets of people. So as one of the software engineers responsible for some of this, what happened with it? So Lee mentioned my ISOM tables. So as you have probably already guessed, our first problem was locking. Really, really bad locking to the point where you start to hit max connections as queries pile up. Then you start to starve your Apache processes as they run out of children. And you know, at that point, you're basically SOL. I hope that's rated for this crowd. <laughs> so easy answer, right? Convert the core tables to NADB. All right, one problem down. Another problem is 13 million people again. All right, not that we had that data set for the whole campaign, but 
it got big pretty fast. When you're going through and cutting your list, you maybe want to know, you know, who in your constituency has done this or who hasn't done this. And then if you want to combine that with another criteria, say you want to know who has signed the default sign-up form. Well, in a lot of cases, that's going to be most of your list. Then you want to combine that with something else or you want to negate it. Well, you just generated a giant amount of IDs and then you're going to throw most of them away. So we added something to our search called negative tables where if the data set that we're after is really large and we have the logical conditions such that we can instead use the inverse, we automatically do the negative query. And this let us return, you know, say, 3,000 rows for people who had done a rare action or hadn't done a, a common action instead of, you know, 13 million minus 3,000. So that's great. Well, we switched to InnoDB, right? And if you want to be smart about how big your data sets are, you need uh, sorry, about doing inverse or negative tables, you need to know how big your data set is. All right, we add a primary key, it's auto increment, we can take the max. Everything goes to hell. Not right then, but a couple weeks later. Looking around, you know, like, what's going on? Well, funny story. Turns out a developer was doing some testing and inserted some high IDs into one of our tables. Because, <laughs> you know, going to create some rows, doesn't want them to really be part of the main data set. They're gonna, he's going to delete them when he's done. It's all going to go away and be fine, right? Right. <laughs> Except for auto increment. You go and insert a value larger than auto increment, auto increment says, I better catch up. <laughs> so. Suddenly, that max ID on the primary key is a billion higher than it used to be. <laughs> so now our calculations for when to return the negative table and when to return the positive table are wrong. All right, well, now we can't use max primary key anymore because we can't fix our table because that would take too much downtime. So all right, we'll just take the count. We'll pay the penalty and we'll cache the ID of the last thing we counted and then update it incrementally. Not so bad, right? Well, still kind of slow. And we probably could have learned how to tune InnoDB better. We did learn how to tune InnoDB better over the course of the campaign, but we had to do something. And so, well, the MyIsom tables were fast, so we'll just make MyIsom tables again except we still need our transactional workload. And you can ask Lee if you want to know why we didn't just do this with replication. But so in the same database, we had my ISOM copies of our InnoDB transactional tables, and we ran our search queries based on that. And that's one of those things that I am not proud of. But <laughs> I also don't have to tell you the ending to this story. Little side note, if you've been to a lot of the talks here, you've probably seen something about the MySQL query analyzer. You've heard a bunch of different people talk about performance tuning and how they do it. Well, this is what we did. And this was created mainly when we were trying to troubleshoot our locking problems, when we were looking to resolve locks instead of essentially punt by going to InnoDB. And this tool pulls show process list and creates a historical data archive. It also will give you real-time results. Uh, it nicely colors locks for you if you still have tables which lock. And it gives you runtime. It gives you all of the show full process list information. But the cool thing on it is that spark line you can see at the top. So that's the historical data. And so after an incident, you want to know, well, why did we have 3,000 queries running at the same time? Well, we can go back up to those spikes. Here you see one there. It's probably around 6 AM and see all of the queries that were running. And you can go back up in 10 second snapshots to see all of the queries that were running as that happened and see what causes things to build up. It's not perfect, doesn't catch everything, takes a lot of work to look into it, but it was an absolute lifesaver during the campaign. Moving things along. So 
I was also responsible for a lot of the mass mail. So if you got email from BarackObama.com, you can come talk to me. <laughs> like Lee said, um, almost 2 billion emails during the course of the campaign, which is about two years. Um, you can go ahead and do the math. So we started out with a sending capacity of about 250,000 emails per hour. That's not going to hold up for 13 million people. Uh, political email especially is very time sensitive. You need releases to get out when it happens. You need to be able to respond to Sarah Palin dissing community organizers, for example. And you know, these are, it's a war room mentality. These are very effective fundraising tools. Uh, email is one of the main ways to bring people into the donation pages. So really, it's got to keep going. So our target was two, two million messages an hour. So the very first thing we did, not even really specific to Obama, but just to any of our larger clients, was parallelize the process. The old mailer written for the Dean days, which you know, got that job done, certainly, was a single thread, looped through all of the recipients, and sent them one by one. Not very good for scaling. So we have a set of demons. They do personalization, because of course all of these emails are personalized. Um, and they do sending in batches, in parallel, multiple threads, multiple machines. And we have not yet hit the limit where the scaling is nonlinear. We hit some bumps, um, but I will show you how we figured out where those bumps were so that we could smooth them out and keep the scaling linear. So you're also sending to over one million people at a time. We have a uh, table for all of our recipients for historical data and to let the demons know what they're doing. Um, we got to the point where when they wanted to send a one million person email, adding data to that, to that table took an hour, which is a pretty horrible insert rate. That's a MyISM table. Again, we probably could have tuned it. We tried tuning it. We made some headway with the key buffer and with cache index. If you don't know this, MyISM, you can cache indexes in different key buffer spaces can be very useful if you've gotten a, an intensive query and you don't want it flushing everything, everyone else's indexes out of the cache. Um, but the really infuriating thing is that on our development server, which was much less powerful than the production database, this query took two minutes, probably less. So you can guess there's some cross traffic going on there but we couldn't exactly get rid of the cross traffic on the production database. Those damn users, right? So our solution, well, if inserting into a table is slow, never insert into a table that's not empty. So we use merge tables. And instead of doing that insert, we just create a new table and add it to the merge. And that sped things up really nicely and it held up for us. Of course, there's a limit on the number of merge tables, so we have an archiver job which compresses old tables. So basically we have a crude form of um, partitioning. We were never, never able to use 5.1 during the campaign based on the mailing. Well, all right, now things are fast for the mailing process again, but now we're causing cross traffic that's hurting the rest of the database. What can we do about this? Well. Again, replication was a complicated beast for us. We didn't have a slave that was up to date enough to really do work on it. But we could take a query on the master, dump the results out using a hack together equivalent to select into local out file, which doesn't exist, ship that data um, just using PHP completely outside of replication to a slave database, load it into a table there, do a bunch of work, calculate our recipient table, dump it again using PHP, select into fictional local out file, send it back up to the master and create the table there. Took a little bit longer because the slave wasn't quite as powerful. Yes, we know that might be one of the reasons we weren't keeping up with replication. And, but it took the load off of the main server. So again, it got us to the end of the story. Well. How did we know that these were the things we needed to do? You may or may not be able to read this, but these are the stats that we keep on all of our mailings. And it stores the profile, the performance profile, 
for the send process and the personalization process. Those are the two main steps in the daemon pipeline. It has the total amount of time, um, and I did have someone tell me previously that, well, that took several years, right? Well, the total process time is CPU seconds. So actually, it's thread seconds. Same difference. So you have to, uh, to get the actual send time, which is up near the top of the slide, uh, you could probably infer how many servers we had going with this and how many threads. Um, we know how long it's taking to assign batches to a server. That's the place where we had to tweak some indexes during the campaign to keep things speedy. We know how long we're taking to hand messages off to postfix. We know how long we're taking in the database for everything. And if you uh, see, if you can read it, under sending performance profile, the send process time is 98.8% rounding a bit. That is the number we want. Pretty much below 98, certainly below 95, we have a problem. If our sending demons are spending any less than 5% of their time doing anything other than handing mail to Postfix, we're not gonna get the rates we want. So, a number of people here have talked about metrics, and I'm just gonna emphasize, yeah, it's really important. At this point, I'm gonna pass it back to Lee. Yeah, no. Um, all right, I'm just gonna go, like I said, my story is unlike these pretty clever things that, that Chuck and Steve uh, and Mikey and Ian are gonna be talking about. Again, this is another sort of cautionary tale. Um, this is sort of what we did for reporting. I get a call uh, late August of 07. Um, one of my guys says, um, hey, the guys in Chicago want access to the database. I said, well, what do you mean by access to the database? He says, well, they, they, they wanna run queries on the database. Really? <laughs> they want to run their own queries on the production database. Yeah, yeah, is that okay? No. No, it's not okay. <laughs> He's like, but they really want it. No, that's one of those things, right? You, this is one of those things you say you want, but you really don't want. So I'm thinking they just want this thing. I am going to just, here's what I'll do. Again, I'm short on time. I'm short of money. Um, I'm short on people. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab some hardware. I've got extra, some spare web servers. I'm going to pull it out and... What I'm going to do is um, just spin up a replica and let them bang away at this replica. This will be their sandbox. And I'm not going to care too much about it. This is a story about feature creep. Uh, one of the problems we discovered through the course of this, actually, was that we started to get a lot of drift on our replicas. We had some you know, non-deterministic statements in our application that we actually discovered through this. Uh, but like I said, I didn't think this was a big deal because I didn't think they were using this uh, for any particular important uh, tasks. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> um, because as these folks from Google are going to tell you, this quick late night fix uh, became something while unbeknownst to us, in Chicago, an entire department of the campaign was being built up around some of the data that was coming out of this reporting database that we had set up for them. And like I said, this was not you know, database server grade hardware. We weren't really paying much attention and I was just skipping all these duplicate key errors. So just to find out how mission critical this, this actually became, uh, I'm going to pass off to, uh, who's going first, Mikey from, uh, from Google, and he's going to tell you just to back exactly how, how much this, how important this became. Oh, you're the yeah. PC, right? Thanks. Sure. So I'm going to need to head over to the PC real quick. There we go. Um, so I'm Mikey, uh, and this is Steve. That's Ian. I'm going to tell you uh, very quickly, some of the projects that we did. Uh, I'm number six. Can anybody hook me up? <laughs> I can yell. Check, check. Any better? Handheld one. Right on. I'm just going to yell. <laughs> <laughs> Any of these things on? Okay. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, first thing I got to say, I got to cover very quickly is uh, important to note that at the time of this uh, action, we were not employed by Google or Obama for America. We are three guys who happen to know each other uh, because we go to the same place every day and sit there a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's another astonishing coincidence that we all have the same shirt. <laughs> 
So I'm going to give you a quick overview of how we got involved with the campaign, then each of them is going to tell you quickly about a project we completed. Uh, we got started around, uh, this is very late, as you can see, this is September. Uh, this is an email uh, that went out from the Obama campaign. They got the idea that they wanted some people to help with analytics, uh, and it made it to one of our internal mailing lists. I, for I forwarded it to a more targeted internal mailing list, which is our group that has to do with MySQL, and Steve was the first one who got interested. He went out there uh, early in September, end of September. Uh, very late, uh, a few days before the election, Ian and I uh, got called in, showed up. They'll tell you that story. Uh, we had no idea what we were walking into when we walked off the plane in Chicago. Uh, I mean, it was the, Google, uh, the uh, Obama uh, analytics team. It sounded very fancy. Turns out it's uh, three or four guys in folding tables and laptops, uh, as you can see. Uh, this is where we worked. Uh, the cleaning services were irregular. It did not always smell springtime fresh. <laughs> We had a whole bunch of data sources that we were handed when we walked through the door. Uh, we had this thing called voter file data from each state. This is the list of registered voters and everything we know about them. Uh, there are commercial uh, data vendors, such as these guys right here, uh, Blue State Digital. To us, as far as we're concerned, they're a data source. So they were there before we were. Uh, the DNC, this thing called the Voter Activation Network, they also gave us data. The Census, commer uh, various commercial databases, this, that, the other thing, and whatever file fell off the back of a truck this morning, that's what we got. <laughs> Um, this is the kind of resources we had to work with. We had two Dell 2950s with uh, disk arrays attached to them. Uh, one of them had MySQL, the other one had Postgres. Don't ask, it was already like that before we got there. Um, there were... <laughs> The, uh, we had some Amazon EC2 instances that were set up for us uh, that we had rented out. We, didn't, we were afraid to rely on them because we were afraid that uh, what would happen would be that they'd stop working on November 4th and then it doesn't matter. A two-hour outage, two outage for us on election day is the whole ball game. There's no point doing our project if that happens. So we tried to only rely on the machines that were actually in the closet there with us. Uh, the total data that we were working with was on the order of a few T. This was all those uh, various uh, sources that I told you about. Um, there are uh, the, for the numbers we're talking about here, there are about 120 million registered voters in the U.S. There are about 60 million that were in the battle, battleground states. Uh, the large, oh, I guess more time just appeared on my thing. Uh, the, uh, um, there were a list of 17 states at the outside that were the ones that we could possibly be interested in. Uh, ones that were possibly going to be competitive in this election, uh, and if you look at just them, it's about 60 million registered voters that we're interested in. We had a lot of information on all of them. Uh, the data was uh, dirty as all hell. A empty value could be represented as a zero, or an empty string, or the string null, N-U-L-L, or the lowercase version of that, or escaped in 15 different ways. is mess. Total mess. Um, every st and not only that, but every state was screwed up in different ways. It wasn't ever the same thing twice. Uh, and there were, like I said, 17 of them that we had to do. So it was really 17 projects. Uh, we just reused some code. Uh, and there are at least two so-called unique primary keys for every voter because different data sources have different ideas. So I'm going to turn you over to Steve, who's going to tell you about one of the first projects we did, which was to do with early votes. So, is the lab on? Yeah, so in September when I got to the campaign, the first project that the analytics guys had me help with was early vote, which I'll refresh your memory here a little bit about what early voting meant in this campaign, but what an early vote is is a ballot that's legally cast before election day. This could be an absentee ballot, this could be a no excuse ballot. Many states require you to have a reason to vote absentee or vote early, many states do not, that's different state by state. Um, the Obama campaign made a strategic decision to emphasize early voting this year. Uh, there was a big change in voter behavior because of that. You can see the numbers there for Florida. But in Florida, there were nearly four times as many ballots cast in 2008 before Election Day compared to 2004. Um, what this gave the campaign was ongoing measurement of progress. So you might want to understand how you measure this progress, right? So we have all the data that Mikey was talking about. And the company Strategic Telemetry specializes in doing a logistic regression model for what individual voters on the voter file and how they will behave. And that model is trained by paid ID calls, so the Obama campaign calling your house, asking you how you want to vote, how you feel on particular issues. And then they look at your demographics and compare those to the demographics of the person who lives next door to you, and they say, well, they might vote like you do. Very simplified as far as what it went into that. Um, we got data for early vote from all of the states that start on a different day that was about 24 to 30 hours delayed, but it told us the identity of someone who had shown up and either requested a ballot or delivered that ballot back to the polling location. 
When I got there, this is the sort of stuff we were doing to try and do analysis on the data that came in. And it didn't work. We were joining through seven, eight, nine tables in order to get all the demographics that we wanted to break down by. We were looking at millions of rows for voters that weren't relevant to the current query that we were running. We were looking at multiple states at the same time instead of individual states. So what I helped build was a processing pipeline that we could run daily on this new data that came in that provided aggregates. What we would do is we'd take some number of demographic columns or static columns, like the date, like what state you're in, whether we know a party affiliation for you because you're in a party registration state, or whether we've imputed what your party is based on what our model score says, whether you voted in the 2004 election, whether you voted in the 2004 general election, whether you voted in the 2006 midterm election, column after column after column. And then what we would do is we would do a roll up, the average, the sum, all of the statistical breakdown that you'd want for that for all kinds of key predicates in front of that. So we might do one by state. We might do one that's broken down by county. We might do one that just looks at gender and age range. We might do one that just looks at ethnicity and age range. We might do one that crosses all states. There were about 45 to 50 different roll-up tables that we built for this, and we did that based on what the normal political process expects to see in terms of reports on the output as opposed to what data we had on the input. So we tailored the data processing pipeline to what we wanted the output to be as opposed to what we had. So this is a quick snapshot of Nevada. I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. The gist of this is that new voters in Nevada, we could see before the election that we were turning them out two to one versus people that we believed were, would vote Republican. In Florida, uh, absentee ballots were coming in for a very long time before uh, early vote in person started. So the day that early vote started, what we have are absentee ballots in Florida, not in person early voting. If you think about the demographics of Florida, most of Florida is retirees, and most of them were Republican aligned, statistically speaking. About a week into early voting, you can see the progress that we've made, and this was a day that Mr. Obama was gonna be in Florida giving a presentation. And the question that the campaign had at this point was, do we have him commit on the topic of early voting is important, go cast your ballot today, or is it not worth doing? I think the decision was made that we wanted to continue to follow through on the early vote message, and then you can see the day of the election, what early vote turnout looked like at 8 a.m. when polls opened, or 6 a.m. when polls opened for the actual election day. That's the 4.2 million ballots in Florida. So somewhere along this line, we realized that we had this system coming along that was called Houdini to remove voters from the voter file to optimize the call tree. It was really to make sure that after you'd been to the polling location, you didn't get a call that day. And we realized that we knew these voters' identities so we said, well, can we get telemetry of what's happening in battleground states on election day in near time as a complementary or contrasting measure to what the news agencies provide? I said, well, that's a little more than I'm going to pull off in a week. Let me call a couple of guys. And Ian's going to talk about what. <laughs> we got this? Can you hear me? Okay, we got a big scary timer up here, so let's call this election day in five minutes. Um, so the original purpose of the Houdini project was to register who comes to the polls so we don't call them for get out the vote. If you already voted, we don't care about you. So, um, so there are people at the polling places next to the person checking in the voters, calling in with numbers, touch tone system, saying this person has voted. Um, Great idea, they, discover, they think, hey, we can do more statistics from this. So Steve calls Mikey and I about eight days before the election. We're in California, we get to Chicago in about 36 hours. We have a 10.30 meeting at night to tell us what our project is. We didn't sleep much that week. Um, so here's the deal, we're getting inputs from FTP sites, first one file, then two files, then five files, then we lost track after a while. Every different format, every different data normalization, complete mess. They've built this web interface that has state layouts, um, and they want data from the input files into these state layouts, great. They also want it to the get out the vote people so they don't call them. They also want the ability to run reporting queries, um, ad hoc, anything they can think of. This data is coming in fast, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Um, but if this is two hours delayed, it doesn't matter. We might as well just go home. 
So this has to move really quickly through the pipeline. Um, they also have all this complicated aggregation they want to do. The data is coming in from precincts. They want to go up to county level, then polling region where they have all these demographic ideas, and then back down to county to display on these maps. Um, and we don't know how much data is coming in. The estimates range from 400,000 votes for the day to 4 million. Um, so Mikey and I designed this system that is really outside of the database. We're using MySQL for data, we're joining against it, but we're trying to be, we built a system that the idea was between steps in the data process, that we save a full snapshot of this to disk. So we have a snapshot of a table between every step in the process. So if we realize we screwed one of these up, we can go back, redo it from that step forward, not have to redo all of it. Um, this comes out in Python, we just pickle data to disk. Um, this is a very simplified version of the pipeline, but basically load some data from the FTP files, figure out which parts of it are new, join it against the database, aggregate it together over a whole bunch of different dimensions, do some math on it, push it out to all these different locations. Turned out we ended up with multiple pipelines beside each other. So, um, Monday night we leave, 2.30 a.m. Um, we get back about 5.30. I said we didn't sleep much. Um, and Two things happened very early on election day that were interesting. First of all, this touch tone system, whoever built that thing wasn't really thinking ahead. Um, they seemed to have planned for about 1% of the calls they actually got. Uh, so this fell over immediately. Uh, nobody can call in. Houdini Project's a complete mess. Um, poll workers are smart, and they think on their feet, and they start calling their friends who are at computers. Houdini has a web interface. They, start, they build their own phone system for this, which was really cool. Um, we also discovered we had pre-run all the early vote data to get a baseline for our election day data, and we discovered that some of our math was wrong. We had a bug. Um, so this actually, the pipeline system worked really well because we ran two of these in parallel. So as we're running the election day data, we're rerunning the early vote data, changing the baseline in the background. Uh, believe it or not, this all worked. Um, so a few things that we did with this data. Um, Indiana, this is election day, this is early afternoon. Um, I'm not sure if you can see these numbers, but 18% of new Democratic voters had voted, 41% of sporadic, and 60% of likely. That 18% is a horrible number. We got all these people out to register, and now nobody's at the polls. So using this information, we have demographic information on who's a new voter. We can direct the calls on Election Day, and we took Indiana. Um, Pennsylvania was called a few minutes after the polls closed, and the McCain campaign called the television networks and said, what, what's up with this, guys? We're, we're close. We're close. Why did you call this? And television networks call the Obama campaign, and we say, well, here's all our statistics. We have three decimal points. These numbers look a little funky because, again, we weren't getting all the data in we were expecting to, but the ratios between them are usually right. And we said, hey, we had a way better turnout here, and it turned out that we did. The spread in PA was more than 10 points. Um, and in North Carolina, we had information during the day that was showing that even though the exit polls were showing a lead for Republicans, we had this big early vote lead that we knew about. So we knew that the, at the rate the voters were actually coming out on election day, they weren't overwhelming the early vote, and we took North Carolina as well. So as you can imagine, campaign headquarters, you find out that you just won a state that was critical and that you probably just took the election, and it's a bit of a party. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And then a few months later, if we could switch back to the Mac real quick, inauguration and win. <laughs> so one more second. We don't have time for questions in here, but if you find us outside, we're happy to answer anything you'd like to ask. Thanks. Thanks.